Hello, and welcome to Guiding Assets, the flagship investment podcast from CFA Institute. In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. John Tobin. John is Managing Director, Portfolio Manager, and Senior Research Analyst for Epoch Investment Partners. The bulk of John's 40-year career has been in fixed income markets, including long stints at Credit Suisse and Bankers Trust, which informs the work he does now as a member of Epoch's Equity Shareholder Yield Team. And it's that intersection of fixed income theory and equity valuation work that interests me and what we'll focus on today. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, Mike. Thank you for having me. Now, duration is, of course, a concept familiar to many of our listeners in the fixed income context. And put simply, uh, for those looking for a 101 reminder, it's a measure of the sensitivity of a bond's price to changes in interest rates. The back of the envelope estimate is that a bond with a duration of eight years will fall roughly 8% for every 1% move in rates, something that bond investors have unfortunately seen in spades this year, as rates have made their most dramatic shift upward in 30 years. We're here to talk today, though, about equity duration. I understand that your team first started looking at equity duration after reading a study about the impact of it in the opening innings of the pandemic. Can you explain what the concept of equity duration captures, and what did that study reveal? So, Mike, well, honestly, we didn't really start to focus on this until maybe the middle of 2021. I wish I could say that in the spring of 2020, we were already all over it, but we weren't. But it grew out of our thinking about uh, the changing interest rate environment. If rates are headed higher, if we've hit an inflection point with interest rates, what, what does that imply for our investment strategy? And the global equity shareholder yield strategy that I work on is an income-oriented strategy. It's a dividend focus strategy. So the rate environment uh, was something that we thought was very relevant. And it started us to think about what the world might be like if the next few years are different than the last few years. And if rates are really headed higher, honestly, like, like all of our peers in the dividend space, the past few years were challenging. Uh, it was a, a market environment where equity investors, they were focused on growth and momentum. And we were sort of uh, left to to sit without a dance partner while everybody else was having a great time at the party. And what we did just, it was out of fashion. And so we were, I guess, hopeful that if interest rates are going to start to go up, then maybe the, the environment changes and it starts to look, look better for us. So one of our colleagues shared with us this article in the Journal of Accounting Research. It was actually published in March of 2021. And that really was sort of the catalyst for us to start thinking about you know, equity duration is 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 really relevant. Um, certainly, uh, something that we should be thinking about in the environment where interest rates are rising and expected to continue to rise. And and really, we might be the beneficiaries of a rotation away from long duration growth equities and towards shorter duration, i.e., dividend paying equities. Um, you know, and as as Mike, you start you started to frame the discussion about duration. Duration is a measure of interest rate sensitivity. In fact, I think when we when we all first learn about what duration is, it's it's first presented as a measure of a, a sort of an alternative, if you will, to maturity or weighted average life. It's what's the pattern of cash flows look like for this asset? How how do they stretch out over time? And it's then that it the duration concept as a sort of a second iteration became a tool for measuring sensitivity to interest rates. But the underlying concept is longer duration implies higher sensitivity to changes in interest rates. And so this, the paper that we we stumbled upon, I shouldn't say stumbled upon, that was shared with us, the authors, they'd actually been doing work in this field for quite some time. The 2021 article in the Journal of Accounting Research was a follow-up. They had published something, I think, in 2002 or 2003 on the concept of implied equity duration. So they've been thinking about it as a, as a group of academics for the better part of 20 years. It was really helpful for us to, to come to that and to start to think about duration and to use duration as a helpful framework for analyzing and understanding equity behavior in a rising interest rate environment. So for uh, listeners interested in reading the original, the title of it is Implied Equity Duration, A Measure of Pandemics Shutdown Risk. And the, and the lead author on that is Patricia DeChow. So fast forwarding. So you started about this time last year. And now today, obviously, a lot has changed in the last 12 months. Uh, today is decidedly not spring of 2020 or even July of 2021. 
So how do you and your team apply to Chow's equity duration conclusions to the present market? What matters to valuations today? Right. Well, you know, as I said a second ago, if you take sort of a longer perspective, it's not just that, gee, the market environment is different today than it was in spring of 2020, but rather the next few years, as I said a minute ago, I think the next few years are going to be very different from the past few years. We've been in an environment for so long, perhaps we can't think of any other environment that would be the prevailing environment really since the global financial crisis. The world has been characterized by very low interest rates, central bank policy rates at zero, below zero in some places, quantitative easing programs, extremely accommodative monetary policy. And that interest rate environment has abnormally low interest rates, has provided a tailwind for valuations, especially for long duration growth stocks. That was the world of the past few years. And this duration concept allows us to look forward and say, you know, if the world is really going to be different in terms of the rate environment, if it's not going to be zero rates anymore, what does that mean? It, it started to, I guess, the thinking that as it evolved was one of, gee, this could really be a challenging market environment for the growthier stocks with stretched valuations. We actually did a webinar in December of 2021 when we were really digging into this. And I guess maybe we're getting a little bit clever with our title, but we titled the webinar Reflation, Duration, and and Salvation. And I think the salvation part was uh, maybe the way we were thinking that finally the interest rate environment will allow st strategies like ours that are focused on identifying companies that are generating cash flow, that are growing cash flow, that are paying dividends, that are rewarding shareholders with attractive growing dividends. Maybe that comes back into fashion. You know, and I, I suppose with you know, at this point in the, in the middle of 2022, we can look back over the past six months and say that this is really exactly what we were thinking back in December. Not too often that we can say that. We, we saw it coming, but it, it really, we've, we've seen it play out. We've seen the, the growthier, uh, long duration equities really face valuation reassessment over the past six months. And I, I guess I would argue that today, the you know, interest rates are, are not going down unless we have a global recession. I suppose we can't rule that out. But if interest rates are not going down, this is likely to continue to remain a headwind for long duration growth equities. So in a way, it's this conceptual framework more than any sort of specific quantification or quantitative tool. I, I wouldn't say to you, for example, that we We've applied the, the, the Chow methodology. We've calculated all the durations of all the equities that we look at, and we specifically screen for stocks that have a duration of less than X. We, we don't do that, but it is something that, it, that we've you know, it's made its way into our conversation. It's, it's routinely a term that keeps coming up as we talk about the market environment, as we talk about the stocks that we're considering for the portfolio, the stocks that we own in our portfolio. My colleagues, we, we find ourselves frequently using that terminology that these are long duration growth equities. This is this is a more challenging environment for them and hopefully a more supportive environment than for the, the slower growth, cash flow generating, dividend paying stocks that are the, the focus of the, the strategy that I that I work on. So it feels to me a bit, John, like we're sort of talking about a couple of themes that obviously have been around in investors' minds for a long time, sort of this idea of interest-sensitive sort of bond proxy stocks like utilities, telecoms that people gravitate to when rates are low and tend to outperform and tend to get valuation stretched and then, you know, give some or all of that back when, when rates start to back up there. And then this, this sort of dichotomy between value and growth and value being you know, generally focused less on, you know, trying to apply a discount rate to long dated cash flows, relying less on long growth rates that extend far into the future at outsized levels. And then as a result, you know, tending to trade at lower valuations. So do you feel like sort of those two are sort of morphing or, or maybe, you know, this, this idea of equity duration might replace those sort of ideas, you know, if to Chow's thinking gets sort of into more into the sort of the popular psyche among investors and in in doing their valuation work? You know, it's an interesting question. And I guess maybe one way to answer it is that the, the familiar, if you will, value versus growth narrative and the duration narrative, I, I think I, I make the case that they're just different ways of talking about the same thing. I don't know that duration becomes the dominant framework, and I think people will still talk about growth versus value. 
rotations between those two camps, if you will. But I think the duration way of thinking about it has certainly caught on. It's been interesting to read more and more about it, to, to see market strategists, to see others really gravitating to this concept and embracing and accepting the idea that this is really relevant, this idea that duration is important. And as you said, the bond proxy terminology, that's, that's another one that's been with us for a long, long time. You know, this strategy that I work on is about 16 years old. And so we've been talking to our investors over the years and depending upon the market environment, that's a question that we've been asked and we've been addressing for a long time. In other words, the view that, gee, you know, if rates are going up, all these dividend paying stocks, they're all bond proxies and they're just going to get hurt as rates go up because that's what, I don't know, that's what the prevailing consensus view is. Bond proxies get hurt when rates go up. And I think what, what the duration framework allows us to do is to respond to that in a very thoughtful and, and if you will, even a rigorous way to say that the concept that all of these dividend paying stocks are bond proxies, first of all, is really not a fair generalization. And as you, you know, in, in, my introdu in your introduction for me, you pointed out that I'd spent a fair amount of my career in the fixed income side. So I, duration is a concept I'm familiar with and bonds. And we all know that when rates go up, bond prices go down and the, the math is unavoidable. It's inescapable. But as I look at dividend paying stocks, again, with a fixed income perspective, I'd say, if you present me with a company that has stable cash flows that aren't growing and a dividend that is the same quarter after quarter after quarter, and that doesn't grow, I'd say, yeah, that looks like a bond to me. I'd, I'd call that a bond proxy. But on the other hand, if you're looking at companies that are growing over time, that are growing cash flow over time, that are paying dividends that grow over time, I'd push back and I'd say, that, that doesn't look like a bond to me. That, that's a different animal. And then in, in response to the, the bond proxy question, it allows us to, to point out, by the way, while you might think that uh, the dividend paying stocks, the, the utilities, the staples, the telecom companies, they're all just bond proxies that are going to get hurt when rates go up, to bring duration into the conversation allows us to, to make the point that indeed it's the growthier stocks with the cash flows, anticipated cash flows far out in the future. Those are the ones that will really be vulnerable in a rising interest rate environment. So it hopefully helps change the conversation away from, you know, I, I should be avoiding all of these bond proxies to a more nuanced understanding that some companies that pay dividends are really not bond proxies at all. And maybe what I should be worried about is not the fact that I've got some staples and some telecom companies and some utilities in my portfolio. What I really perhaps should be worried about is that the risk that I wasn't paying attention to of, of long duration growth equities that are, are really going to be facing valuation headwinds in a rising interest rate environment. So it becomes somewhat more of a, of a risk management exercise around portfolio construction. Exactly, exactly. Okay, well, that, that's that actually a nice segue to you know, as you talk about the the calculation of, of duration and you know how how we do it on the bond side, and it's you know it's a it's an attribution of you know not only the maturity of a bond but those cash flows that are received in the interim that, that goes into that calculation. So I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about quantifying equity duration. Have you and your team attempted to do that at Epoch, and and like, I'm just curious about how you approach it. Yeah, and. And we have. We looked at the, the Chow paper, and I think the first thing we tried to do was replicate what they had done. And of course, you find there is a certain amount of skepticism at the outset where people will say, look, duration is a fixed income concept. How do you possibly apply this to equities? And it's certainly true that if you're looking at a bond, if you've got a 10-year bond that makes, pays a coupon every six months, and it's got a fixed coupon, uh, you you know exactly what the future cash flows are. And so the calculation of duration is very straightforward. You've got 20 cash flows over the next 10 years, and you just plug them in and you calculate duration. The challenge for equities... And, and an assumption as well, that an assumption that those cash flows will always be paid. Well, that's true too. Yes. That you will actually get paid all of your coupons and then even get your money back at maturity. But so the challenge then for calculating duration for equities is to, well, the recognition that equities represent a perpetuity, really, out into the infinite future. 
and the cash flows are not fixed. They're, they're variable. And even if you look at dividend payments, dividends change over time. So it computationally is challenging, but conceptually, it, it certainly applies. And so some of the methodology that uh, what, I guess maybe one of the first hurdles to get over is, well, you need future cash flow projections, right? And the answer is yes, that's exactly what you need. And the methodology that the, the Chow team used and that we've tried to replicate is to use historical data and then to marry the historical data with consensus estimates from the sell side for the next five years, and then to make some assumption about what then takes place from five years out to for the next 15 years. The time frame, incidentally, and not to get too deep in the weeds here with the, the calculations, but while you might think, as I said a minute ago, that, gee, how do you project infinite cash flows into the future? Turns out you don't actually have to. There, there's sort of limits in, in the duration calculation. And the longest duration calculation turns out to be about 24 years. So what you really need is you need some projection of cash flows for a fairly long period of time, but not for the next 20 years, 30 years, and certainly not to infinity and beyond. So that's one of the computational challenges. The, uh, as we worked on it in our shop and got comfortable with the way that the Chow folks did it, we started to, to tinker with it and to address what we thought might be some assumptions that maybe we weren't that comfortable with. And, and I, just to share with you, for example, as I, as I looked at what the Chow method used and their methodology, for coming up with cash flow projections, I thought, you know, as an analyst who looks at companies, what do I do? I make a projection for the top line for revenues. I have some assumption, objectively based, I hope, on the evolution of margins. I've got some understanding based upon the company's behavior and practice in the past about how net income is it turns into cash flow. So we we tried an alternative methodology, which was more intuitive, I think. The results were pretty similar. And I think it, it, it really is truly a work in progress, but I think we've kind of come full circle to realize that the, the methodology that the, the, the Chow team was using is a little bit more straightforward computationally, and the results are pretty similar anyway. So just to share with you, for example, as we, as we went through this, we, uh, in our study, we wanted to see, can we calculate what's the average duration for our portfolio? What's the average duration for our benchmark index? We're benchmarked against the MSCI World Index. And what's the average duration for maybe the, the NASDAQ 100 as an, an index that would capture the longer duration, growthier stocks that are out there? And we're satisfied, well, I suppose I should say gratified, to see that as we did these calculations, we came up with a, a this was back in March when we did these calculations, weighted average duration for our portfolio of 11.3 years, weighted average duration for the MSCI World Index of about 13 and a half years, and a weighted average duration for the NASDAQ 100 Index of about 16 years. And so, as I said, maybe gratified is the right word to use, that this concept made sense to us. And as we dug into the calculations, it sort of proved itself out that this, this makes sense. This, we're getting calculations and results that are in line with what we, we hoped we'd find and what we expected to find. So it's, um, it, it's something we're still working on, but it's, it's been really interesting to, to really roll up our sleeves and, uh, and take a stab at it. Well, it'll be uh, it'll be great with those numbers in hand to be able to to, to back test those as we go forward over the next six to twelve months to see if rates keep backing up, to be able to see whether those sensitivities bear out. Mm -hmm. So, my final question here for you, John, is two parter. What was your first job in the industry? And if you could go back and take yourself for coffee on your first day, what key piece of advice would you offer yourself? Yeah, that's. I sometimes have referred to myself as the accidental tourist. I started out in working for one of the major central banks, uh, central banks, one of the major uh, New York City banks in their economics department. I was a business economist. That was my career goal when I finished my graduate work, just to go into, into that field. 
And after doing that for a few years, I thought, I really want to get closer to the investment decision-making process. And that's when I decided to sign up for the, the CFA course and, and pursue getting my CFA charter. And so as I think back on how that evolved for me, maybe the advice I would give to a young person, if I could, or to myself, if I could speak to myself at that point in time, would be just not to limit yourself by having a rigid goal. So when I did finally make it into the investment management world, the opportunity that came to me was on the fixed income side. And my first reaction was, well, shoot, I wanted equities. I didn't really want to do bonds, but that was the offer I had. And it was, as it turns out, high yield bonds. So I ended up spending a good part of my career in the high yield bond market. And not where I, I, I can't tell you that I started out with that as an objective, and that's exactly where I wanted to go. And of course, it, I'm coming up on my 10th anniversary now at Epoch on the equity side of the street. So I guess it's it's a big it's a big field out there, investment management. It covers a lot of territory. And maybe the the, the advice I give is, as I said, don't limit yourself by having a rigid goal. Don't say I want equities. I don't want fixed income. Don't say I want buy side. I don't want sell side. Be open to those opportunities. You never know where they're going to lead. And there'll be another fork in the road somewhere and you'll have a chance to, to redirect your career later on. So uh, just kind of go with the flow. I've been joined today by Dr. John Tobin, Managing Director, Portfolio Manager and Senior Research Analyst for Epoch Investment Partners. Thanks so much for your time today, John. Thanks for having me, Mike. I really enjoyed this. I'm Mike Wahlberg and this has been Guiding Assets.